All right. Thank you all for coming to see my talk on uh, spy flash emulation. It's a little different from a lot of the talks here that are on network security. This is on hardware security. So there are three questions that I think we want to address in this talk. You know, what are spy flashes? Why do we want to emulate them? And what are the challenges in doing so? So it, it, if we look at a modern mainboard, there's a small uh, chip on the uh, on there that stores the firmware. It's frequently called a boot ROM, but it's actually a, a flash chip. And it stores the code that the CPU executes when it first starts up. Uh, in old days, they were 64 kilobytes, and they had uh, classic BIOS. Um, but these days, uh, folks want a lot more space. So if we look up at the data sheet for one of these chips, we can see that they're... Um, uh, they're quite a bit bigger. They're about uh, 128 megabit, 16 megabytes, and that's a lot more space for, uh, for, for firmware. Things like UEFI, uh, which is in most commercial mainboards, is really an entire uh, operating system uh, stored in that chip. And there's also open source ones like uh, Linux boot and then the uh, core boot firmware that runs on pretty much every uh, Chromebook. So why do we want to emulate them? Well, if you're working on core boot or Linux boot, or if you're looking for security vulnerabilities in UEFI, you end up having to reflash these chips all the time. And I've actually spent a huge amount of my time waiting for these flash chips to flash. Uh, I, I do a lot of firmware research, so I spend a lot of time watching progress bars as this, these things write. And you might say, well, but Trammel, these things are only 16 megabytes. How long could it take to, uh, to rewrite one? And the problem is that they're designed as ROMs, so they don't have fast updates. The, you have to erase them four kilobytes at a time, and in the worst case, it takes 120 milliseconds to erase a four kilobyte uh, page out of this chip. So if we say we want to rewrite the entire one, 16 megabytes divided by 4K times, times 120 milliseconds, we're talking about eight minutes, uh, worst case, waiting uh, to, to rewrite the contents. That's really bad. So let me walk you through how my day used to be before I built the Spy Spy. I finally finished building Core Boot, and I have to turn off the power to the machine I'm going to flash. I have to attach the flash programmer to the chip, because most of the times you can't um, leave them attached due to uh, electrical, electrical issues on the lines. And when you start flashing, uh, most of the programmers will try to say, oh, this hasn't changed, so they won't update it. So the management engine section typically goes pretty fast, because it just has to read it, check it. But then it has to start erasing the blocks and uh, writing the new contents. And it starts to slow down. You know, three minutes in, you know, 28 kilobytes per second, you know, so much time's going by. It's really not a fun way to spend your day. You know, five minutes later, it's still flashing. It... So with this particular one, five and a half minutes later, average of 49 kilobytes per second, it's done. But there's still more. You have to remove that programmer, power the system back on. And if anyone here has actually tried building Core Boot and flashing it, you probably know what comes next. It, it didn't work. So you go back, you tweak the config, you rebuild, and you do it again. And at five to eight minutes cycle time, it's really hard to make progress. There's got to be a better way. And so with the Spy Spy, it really is a lot easier. Uh, you can clip it to the board, and you leave it clipped on, because it, the system runs with it attached. And so here's a video of actually doing a core boot upload uh, into uh, that, that main board. We can see the progress bar going. The LEDs on the on the board are flashing as it's receiving the data, and it's actually buffering it into RAM on that board. So it's not it's not actually writing it into the flash chip. Um, so 12 seconds later, almost one megabyte per second, 
in this case, we're actually limited by the USB speed uh, for how fast we can we can upload data into that SD RAM. And then the other nice thing is that you can soft reboot into this. You don't have to power cycle. This means it's it's much easier to build into like a continuous integration pipeline where you can have uh, new firmwares be tested uh, every time there's a Git push. So let's talk a little bit about why. I mean, that, that's one reason why we want to do it. But there's another real reason, which is security research. You might think, if you've uh, come to uh, Luxembourg from the 1970s, that CPUs still start at the, the reset vector at the top of memory. Um, but that hasn't been the case for many, many years of Intel CPUs. With the spy spy, we get a log of all of the flash addresses as they're being read from the chip when the CPU is started. So we can see that very first read uh, when the platform controller hub interrogates the chip to find out if, if it's uh, present. We can see the Intel management engine as it reads its uh, firmware partition tables and does its uh, signature validation. We can see 12,000 reads later when the x86 finally starts up, um, but it still isn't reading user code. This is the firmware interface table uh, that has the microcodes, which are then uh, parsed by the CPU and applied. And then uh, if there's a boot guard on the CPU, the boot guard ACM is then run. And then finally, that re legacy reset vector is, is uh, invoked which then jumps to the, uh, the BIOS code and the system starts up. There is a whole lot of stuff happening before any user code is executed. And the spy spy gives us this insight that uh, might have been very difficult to find out about. The other thing that you can do with these addresses is you can plot them and look for interesting patterns. So in this case, we've plotted the addresses on the y-axis versus the time uh, of the read. And we've colored them so that the blue ones are the first time an address is read. And this is typically when uh, something like Boot Guard or the management engine is doing its signature check. And these orange ones then are when the address is read a second uh, or third time from the flash which is when it's actually being used by the CPU. And this is what's called a time of check, time of use uh, error. And it is possible to bypass a lot of secure boot systems that uh, make these, this sort of mistake, because they assume that the flash chip is, uh, is actually a ROM. Uh, my collaborator, Peter Bosch, and I were able to find a, a bypass in Intel Boot Guard that uh, we presented at Hack in the Box earlier this year um, and then worked with Intel to, uh, to try to come up with a fix. It's taken its time to make it through the firmware vendors. Um, you can watch one of my Linux boot talks where I talk about the difficulty with the, uh, the firmware supply chain and the fact that uh, most systems actually never will get this fix. So you'll potentially be able to bypass boot guard on a lot of these machines for their entire lifetime. So hopefully we've had a good motivation for why we want to do this. Let's talk a bit about how it works. You all are a bunch of nerds. You probably are interested in the technical details. And like a lot of open source projects, this builds on work that other people are doing. You know, this would not be possible without the wonderful work from the, the Yosis and uh, Project Trellis and XPNR uh, open source FPGA toolchain. These folks have done amazing work at reverse engineering uh, FPGAs and building a community around uh, 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 reprogrammable hardware. I also want to thank the, my collaborators, uh, Alyssa Milburn and uh, Peter Bourne, who worked with me on the, uh, the Toctile vulnerability in BootGuard. Uh, we were hanging out at the, their hackerspace in Den Haag, uh, RevSpace, when, uh, uh, when we were developing it. And for that one, we used a fairly small FPGA, the ICE40 UP5K, which has one megabit of block RAM. 
um, which is enough to store a small uh, boot guard bypass, but not a full firmware image. Um, and just uh, this is kind of a fun chart. You can see the same blue and orange lines. So many talk towels. I mean, seriously, it, this this chip was just absolutely full of them. So, however, to, when we wanted to build a full flash emulator, we needed something a little bit larger. And again, we were able to uh, turn to the open hardware community. The Radiana hackerspace in Croatia uh, has built this really nice uh, board with the ECP5 uh, FPGA. And the really key feature that it has is a 32 megabyte uh, SD RAM, which is enough to store the entire contents of a flash. In fact, we could store two flash images if we wanted to do a full talk towel, but we haven't needed to do that. And we can read and write from this flash chip at hundreds of megabytes per second. The problem with SDRAM is it's really complicated. It is full of these sort of dark magic state machines that you have to implement uh, for, you know, how does, uh, for interacting with it. It's not quite like that, but it's still, it's pretty messy. Um, I'm, I'm lazy. I don't want to have to write all that. And luckily, there's the open source FPH, FPGA community has already done so. So we were able to borrow the a, a full SDRAM controller uh, that had a, a compatible license and use that to interface with those chips. I also want to give a, a shout out to Scanline, who does amazing reverse engineering work. Uh, she published some a project uh, for emulating S um, uh, I'm sorry, Nintendo DS uh, flash chips, which was really instrumental in giving us a lot of insight in how do we build the state machine to uh, to emulate them. So let's let's look a little bit about what that state machine looks like. Um, if we go back to the data sheet for these chips. Uh, they typically will give you a uh, pin configuration, so you can identify from the dot uh, how the pin is oriented, or excuse me, how the chip is oriented, uh, and then also the all-important power and ground pins. The next important pin is the chip select, which uh, goes low when the PCH, or the CPU, wants to talk to the flash chip. So uh, we call this... Um, uh, this transaction an active low signal because it, it goes it uh, at idle it is at um, uh, one or some voltage and it at uh, when it's active it's at ground. There's also a clock that's generated by the PCH or the x86 uh, that uh, is used to read uh, data from the chip. And on the, on the falling edge of the clock, the data lines can change their value. And then on the rising edge of the clock, uh, the lines have to be, uh, have to have their data, uh, stable. So we would call this a rising edge clock signal. The other important pin is there's a serial in, which is the commands from the x86 to the flash chip. And then the serial out pin carries the uh, response bytes from the flash, uh, usually the data that's being read from the chip. So if we go, uh, the next page in the data sheet talks about what are those commands. Um, there are a lot of different read commands uh, that the, the systems can use. The most common one is the, uh, the, the normal read, and uh, it has its own timing diagram. Most of these data sheets are, uh, have extensive documentation because they, they expect that people who are implementing this are probably building hardware to do it. So it's, uh, uh, the hardware documentation tends to be pretty, pretty good for a lot of this. So the 03, again, is the normal read. And then it's followed by 24 bits of the address to read from the chip. Uh, 2 to the 24 is uh, 16.7 million, so that's the 16 megabytes. And then uh, at the end of those 24 bits uh, come the response bytes, and typically 256, uh, up to about 256 of them will be clocked in from the, uh, from the, the chip. 
the Verilog for the um, uh, for the IS40 version was pretty simple. It had a shift register that would shift in the address bits uh, on the rising edge of the, the spy clock. And then once it had uh, 24 of them, it would read uh, from a, an array of block RAM into the output register. And this worked great on the, uh, uh, the ICE-40 with the block RAM, but when we tried it on the SD RAM, there was a problem. We ended up uh, glitching, and uh, our first bit of output was delayed by about 50 nanoseconds. And this meant that the CPU wouldn't boot because the data just uh, was not valid. And the reason for that is that SDRAM uh, doesn't read values uh, very quickly. Um, you, you might think, oh... You know, we're, we have multi-gigahertz CPUs, we're clocking our memory at, uh, you know, 1.3 or 1.6 gigahertz, but it still takes around 100 nanoseconds for a CPU to get a random byte from memory. And that's problematic in this case because we need it much sooner. So with, with D, uh, DRAM is built from a huge number of capacitors, and when you do a read, what it will copy what's called a... Uh, a row of of those capacitors into uh, registers called, and this is a row activation, and that takes some amount of time uh, during which you can't do anything else with the SDRAM. And then once that's finished, you can then send the column address uh, to read an individual uh, word from from that row, and that then also takes a few clock cycles. Uh, and typically, you know, it's with, with the SDRAM we were working with, it's five to seven clocks, about 50 nanoseconds, and this is why we are glitching. But, uh, oh, sorry, um, the, the, the big problem is that if you try to do the read once you have the full address, you really only have that half a clock cycle, about 25 nanoseconds, to, uh, to, to make the read happen. And that's much, much too short for the uh, the SDRAM. It's also much too short if we let the spy clock run at higher frequencies. We've had to uh, bring the clock down to its minimum of 20 megahertz. But since we were building this out of programmable hardware, we can get pretty clever with the sort of things that we can do. So once we have the first 14 bits of the address uh, off the wire, we can start the row activation cycle in the SDRAM. And then once we have the uh, another nine bits off the wire, we can activate, the, we, we can read the column uh, to get a 16-bit word uh, from it. And then when we have that last bit of address, we can use that to select which byte out of that word we want to use, that we want to put on the wire. And uh, with, with these hacks in place, it actually works. Uh, we're able to get the first bit of that response on the wire with only about a 10 nanosecond uh, delay. And it, that 10 nanosecond is caused by uh, uh, what's called a clock crossing uh, uh, issue on the, on the FPGA. Um, we might be able to re-architect our design and completely eliminate that, uh, that delay at all. Um, and again, as I mentioned, this is the slowest 20 megahertz clock. Uh, it would be nice to be able to run faster, but right now that's what we're limited to due to the, uh, the FPGA. If we, if we uh, try to see what is this, actually, this read actually happening, um, we can actually, you can literally see the zeros and ones. And if you don't speak binary, that's a 5A, A5. And if we look at a hex dump of the flash chip, we can see that occurs in the, uh, the first uh, 16 uh, bytes of, of the chip. And we can learn from uh, Zeno, uh, Z Zeno and uh, Butterworth's talk about it, uh, Intel BIOS that that is the fla Intel flash descriptor. This is what the PCH reads when it first starts up to ensure that there's a valid chip there. And if it's not there, the CPU won't even start up at all. So CPU can now start up. We typically get some ways into the boot, but 
we kept having a lot of just instability. We would get errors uh, midway through where you know we'd get like flash uh, checksum errors. Sometimes the system wouldn't boot, and it turns out there's another problem uh, that we're having. And that's uh, due to the auto refresh in that uh, in the uh, SDRAM, because S uh, DRAM is built with capacitors, they slowly are losing charge, and you have to periodically read each row uh, to uh, refresh it and write it back into the into the capacitors. Uh, typically, there's a timer in the SDRAM controller that just runs periodically. And when that's happening, all of your memory reads get delayed. But again, we're writing our own memory controller. So we can add an additional control line that will stop that counter as soon as the chip gets selected and as soon as we realize that we have a timing critical need for access to the flash. And this is you know, a huge uh, uh, reason that open source and open hardware is really enabling of a lot of these technologies. You might have seen in a lot of the photos that we're using these solder, these uh, chip clips to you know, clip onto the board. And you might be thinking, but wait, isn't that going to be driving the same pins or the same wires that the, the, the real flash chip is driving? You know, how do we avoid uh, uh, having two drivers on the same circuit? And th this was a neat observation that, uh, that Peter and I made, that on, on most main boards, the uh, the chip select line going into into the flash passes through a small series resistor um, uh, for on the uh, the, the uh, PCH output, and this means that the FPGA can essentially override the PCH and tell the flash chip, you know, this isn't the transaction that it, that is looking for, that it's not selected. So schematically, uh, this is what. The what it looks like when we put the chip clip on uh, on the board. So the PCH will drive the uh, CS line low, which will uh, activate the flash chip, which will start to drive data on the uh, serial outline. Um, the FPGA then uh, turns the CS in out from an input into an output, drives it back high, and when it does that, uh, the flash chip thinks that it is no longer selected, so it will it will stop driving the serial outline. And once it does that, the FPGA can then clock uh, can put its own data on the serial outline, essentially bypassing uh, the contents of the of the real flash chip. The downside is that the uh, the FPGA now can't see what the uh, uh, the actual value of the, the x86's chip select line is. So it doesn't know when the transaction is done. So we, we're using another trick, which is to watch the clock line, and when the clock line stops transitioning, we assume that that means that the transaction is over, and the FPGA can then uh, uh, switch the CS back to an input and let the PCH take control of the, uh, of the uh, spy bus again. So, with all these tricks in place, it works, and it was such a wonderful feeling to be able to boot a entire machine all the way from uh, you know from, from power on um, into an OS with you know, completely emulating it. But what made me really proud is that White Quark said that, that it was impressive, and White Quark is just an amazing reverse engineer. I highly recommend you check out her Twitter feed for all sorts of fascinating trivia about uh, how these. You know what's happening inside of computers. Um, so yes, that, that that was a real point of pride for me to to receive that compliment from her. So it works on uh, pretty much every laptop we've tested on. We have it working on a lot of servers, and servers are an interesting case because there's another CPU there on that server mainboard uh, called the BMC, and uh, I, I gave a talk at CCC last year about. The, uh, the dangers of the BMC because they're connected to pretty much every uh, piece, of, every uh, security critical component of the uh, of the server. Uh, they can do DMA, they can talk to the spy flash, they can talk to the TPMs. 
So being able to, to do security research in this area is really important. Um, and they actually, uh, like a lot of these systems, they store their firmware in a, another spy flash chip on the main board. So by being able to put the spy spy on, on the BMC's chip, we're able to do uh, research and also uh, help out projects like uh, MicroBMC and OpenBMC that are building open source firmware for these auxiliary CPUs. And that's a successful boot on the super micro board. Another area that we're doing some active research in is uh, the AMD platform support processor, which is a uh, an ARM-based uh, system uh, that's built into the uh, uh, AMD CPUs. And uh, there's a team in uh, TU Berlin that's been able to get code execution uh, in the PSP, and they're using the SPY SPY to be able to do more rapid iteration on their uh, their attacks against it. So really neat uh, research going on there. Uh, in this case, this was, yes, uh, trying to validate that what we were sending was what we thought we were sending. Um, so, it's open source. would love for you all to uh, join the project and help out. Um, if you know, it's a great way to learn Verilog in a, uh, uh, you know, in, in a way that you can actually do some really neat things with it. Um, the, uh, as I mentioned, we now support the ARMs both in the BMC and the, the PSP. Um, but we have a lot of features that would help out a lot with uh, performance. You know, things like being able to do uh, dual and quad sp uh, spy reads. Um, uh, a better UI would be really wonderful. It's, it's definitely built by a bunch of programmers for other hackers. Um, there's also a, a group working at uh, using the same hardware to do uh, LPC, which is another bus on the system where there's some security critical components. Uh, so. And we have some folks that are looking at doing uh, eSpy as well, which will help with uh, doing security research on uh, modern MacBooks. So uh, you can see a version of this talk, uh, an annotated version with um, uh, with links at, on my website. Um, you can check out the source code on, on GitHub. We have a fairly active uh, channel on the, um, uh, the open source firmware Slack. And I'm also available on uh, Mastodon and uh, the Bird site and some other places if, if you have some questions. So I'm here for the rest of the day as well. And if you have some questions now, I'd love to uh, help answer them.